Group B, the scariest thing to happen in the woods since ghosts were invented. <gasps> it was too beautiful and dangerous to exist in this world, just like Heath Ledger. Yes! Group B, a world rally class whose four year history would be cemented in the mind and myths of race fans for years. At its peak, thousands lined the streets to bear witness to the speed and fury of the cars and their engines that exploded in a beautiful cacophony of flat fours, V6s, and inline fives. With nearly no regulations placed on the cars, fearless drivers thrived as they hurtled through actual streets of actual towns all over the world on snow mud and asphalt. The Group B drivers defied belief and cheated death. How did Group B come about? How did it end? Well, grab your helmet and tighten up your harnesses, baby, because we're going for a ride. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on Group B. This episode of Up to Speed is brought to you by Movement Watches. I wear mine every day and I've already been married nine times. Before Group B, the WRC was pretty cool. A bunch of cars racing around, doing the best they can do to squeeze performance out of production cars. A lot of well-loved cars and game-changing technology came out of WRC Group A. The legendary five-cylinder Audi Quattro being just one of those. But Group A had a ton of restrictions on power, size, technology, cost, and the base model for a Group A auto had to be mass-produced with at least 5,000 units a year and had to have four seats. In contrast, Group B had few restrictions on technology or design and only required that the weight was kept as low as possible. High-tech materials were permitted and there were no restrictions on boost. And for homologation requirements, manufacturers only needed to produce 200 cars. I mean, I made 200 cars last week. It's nothing. Plus, they left a special evolution clause that meant year to year, if an update was made to a model, only 20 cars needed to reflect the change. In Group A, you'd need to manufacture a fresh 5,000. That's also what they used to call me in high school, fresh 5,000. So. The only restrictions in Group B were the cabin had to fit two seats, it could not be open room a minimum weight calculated by engine displacement, maximum tire width calculated by engine displacement. And that's it, those are all the rules. It took about a season for manufacturers to realize the limitless performance potential of the group. In its first year, Audi did little to change the Quattro from its Group 4 setup, but its still innovative drivetrain was advanced enough to carry Hanu Mikola to the driver's title in 1983. Lancia, however, made more bold improvements to their rear drive 037 in shape, weight, and power, and the car was consistent enough to take the manufacturer's title that year. After its inaugural season, Group B's low homologation requirements attracted more manufacturers and more experimentation. Opel replaced their production-derived Escana with the Group B Manta 400, and Toyota built a new car based on their Celica. Like the Lancia 037, both cars were rear-wheel drive. They were powerful, and they could dominate on asphalt, but they were still falling short when the terrain became less stable. And this was the beauty of Group B Rally. The restrictions were so few that manufacturers were free to explore the best combination of power and drivetrain that would work over a myriad of different surfaces. While Opel, Audi, and Toyota were making tweaks to their existing cars, other teams realized the low homologation requirements would allow them to start with a clean slate. Peugeot engineer Jean Dot studied the restrictions, looked to Audi's success, and came up with a shorter four-wheel drive car with more rear-biased weight distribution. The Peugeot 205 T16 was homologated midway through 1984, featuring a mid-mounted 1.8 liter turbocharged engine, 350 horsepower, and four-wheel drive. It was immediately competitive and became dominant from August onward. The Evolution nudged 400 horsepower. It would have won its first race, but driver Ari Vatanen crashed just before finishing. He was leading the pack by a lot. And speaking of crashes, these races and cars were getting so gnarly that crashes began happening more and more frequently. Vatanen led a ton of races for Peugeot, but seldom won because he had a consistent record of crashing just before winning. Sounds like my love life. 
Part of the thrill of watching the races was the excitement of knowing that drivers were towing the line between triumph and calamity. Michelle Mouton, who Nikki Lauda described as Superwoman, was notorious for her fearless driving, and she was no stranger to gnarly exits either. In her first Group B race, she slid through a patch of ice and crashed at over 100 miles an hour. Drivers were going so fast through such tight turns that their skills were being tested like never before. Bjorn Waldegard looks back at the danger less romantically. He's since said, the cars were so quick, your brain could not react in time. It was just too much. That sounds nuts. Listen, these cars were using Kevlar doors to save on weight. They were using massively overpowered engines and employing cutting edge suspension out of necessity. Body kits were radical amalgams of aero innovations and induction channels or cooling vents. Bigger engines meant wider wheelbase and tires, but a heavier minimum weight. As small engine power output improved, you'd have the lightest cars on the circuit pumping out over 400 horsepower. The technological achievements of Group B were at once a recipe for glory and all out disaster. And guys, if you're getting upset because I keep using the word gnarly, after races, when they worked on the cars, mechanics would find things like severed fingers in the cars. Teams had therapists and psychologists on retainer because just working on group B cars was that traumatic. Those who won or placed in stages were exalted, but just finishing a race alive was enough to cement your status as an elite rally driver. By the end of 1985, in addition to ravenous Group B attendants and accomplished heroic drivers, there was an outright cornucopia of competing cars, all testing theories about the right mix of balance, power, weight, and wheels. Lancia replaced their outclassed 037 with the Delta S4, which featured both a turbocharger and a supercharger. Ford had returned after several years away with the Ford RS200, which made a purported 550 horsepower at all four wheels. Citroen developed and entered the BX4 TC, which was a cumbersome little beast. Rover created the distinctive Metro 6R4, which featured almost comical boxy bodywork and a large spoiler mounted on the front of the car. And Audi's new Sport Quattro S1 boasted over 600 horsepower and had a freaking snow plow for the front end. We are now in uncharted territory and the stage is set to find out the world's best rally car and the world's best driver. And one young Finnish driver, Henry Tovonen, after years of unfulfilled potential was emerging as a gifted wunderkind for whom Group B seemed to be the perfect format. Where more mature drivers were all too aware of the dangers, Henry in his mid 20s pushed as hard as he could. Rally legend Walter Rawl said Henry was a little bit crazy. He was fast and always getting faster like someone in a trance. Henry reached the point where it was only a question of time before something went badly wrong. And in early 1986, something did go badly wrong. On the Lagoa Azul stage of the Portuguese rally near Sintra, Portuguese national champion Joaquim Santos crested a rise, turning to his right to avoid a small group of spectators. This caused him to lose control of the RS200. The car veered to the right and slid off the road into the spectators. 31 people were injured and three were killed. All the top teams immediately pulled out of the rally and Group B was placed in jeopardy. This crash came a year after Lancia driver Atilio Bottega crashed and died in his 037. His co-driver was uninjured, so the fatality was largely blamed on the unforgiving Corsican scenery and bad luck. But with such a massive injury toll and the death of three spectators, the Lago Azul accident was making it apparent that Group B may be too dangerous to exist. The promising driver Toivonen and his co-driver Sergio Cresto sat at the start of the Tour de Corsa waiting for the signal. When they launched in the turbo and supercharged Lancia, all four wheels gripped at the pavement to send them hurtling past hundreds of spectators who lined the streets. But just seven kilometers into the stage, their S4 blew off the unguarded edge of the tight left turn and plunged down a steep wooden hillside. The fuel tanks ruptured and the car became a fireball on impact. When crews arrived nearly 30 minutes later, the Inferno had left nothing of the Lancia but a charred tangle of tubing. Toivonen and Cresto's death combined with the Portugal tragedy forced the FIA to act. Group B cars were immediately banned in 1987. Group B was done. It was an amazing time in automotive ingenuity and ultimately proved too dangerous to exist. Could it happen today with modern technology and safety? Honestly, probably not. There is a certain beauty in those things that scare us. The raw power and magnificence of a waterfall as you stand at the base, the exhilaration atop a cliff as you 
stare down to the hard earth stories below. This is the allure of Group B. It was an intersection of a carrying aspiration and technology and racing that can never be duplicated. And it's become all the more mythic for its short existence. This episode of Up to Speed was brought to you by Movement Watches. Movement was founded on the belief that style shouldn't break the bank. Their goal is to change the way consumers think about fashion by offering high quality, minimalist products at revolutionary prices. With over 1 million watches sold to customers in over 160 countries, Movement has solidified itself as the world's fastest growing watch company. It's like the Volkswagen GTI of watches. Simple, cool looking, and functional. To so go to mvmt.com backslash donut media or just click the link in the description below. Use promo code donut media, duh, and you will receive $15 off of any of their sweet watches or sunglasses. Did I mention free shipping and free returns? They got boy stuff. They got girls stuff. They got stuff for dads. The watches start at 95 bucks. The sunnies start at 70 bucks. You can get them polarized, just like one of them giant white bears from the North Pole. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on Group B. This one was a little bit serious. Not a lot of jokes. It's pretty much about people dying. How many times have you watched those Group B videos on the internet, which is like, uh, Send me a dollar for a Lamborghini. And as always, like, comment, subscribe, and share.